the rapid increase, it was kind of like a tsunami of patients coming in every day. I think that was the other piece that really took us by surprise is really how sick these patients were going to get and how quickly they were going to deteriorate from the time they hit our door um, in needing, you know, advanced levels of care pretty quickly. On discharge, going, going to the car, and immediately the response was, when we called the response, the, our ED team as well as our security guard, and you, as, as we do it normally, everybody crowded around, and there was no PPE on anybody's hands, face, and everybody was exposed. We thought literally we were going to lose almost a third of our, our staff at one time. You're out communicating. Everybody's scared. They're looking to us. We we go out with one plan, and then a couple hours later, the next day, we have a different plan about the same exact item. So it was constantly that reinforcement and education. Why are we doing this? This is what we've learned from the CDC. I think really partnering closely with our um, infection practitioners and our physician providers. Um, they kept providing us with what was out in the literature and what they were reading from other countries, from local um, and really just trying to stay on top of the most current knowledge. There wasn't a day that we ran out of PPE. We made sure that we did rounds three times a day to make sure that we had what we needed for frontline staff, the physicians, the support personnel that were coming in and out of the departments to do diagnostic testing procedures to ensure that they had what they need to protect them. What about those stars that you have working for you every day? Because everybody had to step it up a notch. Our employees were scared for themselves. They were scared for their for their families. I mean, you know, you talk to employees who were sleeping in tents in their backyard because, you know, they had toddlers at home and they, they didn't want to take a chance of getting their family sick, but yet they came back day after day. When we look at staffing, I'll never forget the Saturday morning that I was notified that we had four patients on ventilators, but no nurse to care for the patient. And so, very early on, I realized that the capacity to not only lead the group, but to lead from within was an imperative if we were going to get through this crisis. And so what did I do? I left church, came into work, and I actually put on my uniform and I took care of those four patients on ventilators that Saturday morning from 9 a.m. until 7 p.m. We redeployed everybody. I mean, we, we had wound nurses, med surge, with ED med surge, OR turned to ICU, cardiac nurses turned to supervisors, supervisors turned to infection control. I mean, doctors turned to phlebotomists. I mean, cardiac cath turned to ICU. Everybody was somebody. Whether it was a nurse, whether it was a doctor, whether it was a plant operations team member, as Dell said, everybody was going above and beyond. When the ardent nurses came in, uh, you could just feel uh, such a positive uh, reaction from our staff. I mean, they were tired, they were emotionally drained. Uh, and then they saw nurses that didn't need to be there, but chose to be there, you know, as we call the why of what you're doing. And that really, um, that really made a difference. If at no other time, we truly demonstrated the power of one um, as a collective organization. The nurses that came to our aid did not see themselves as ardent nurses from Tulsa or ardent nurses from East Texas. They saw themselves as ardent nurses at another ardent facility doing what it is that they were compassionate about. And those nurses came in as brave and courageous, willing to be thrown into the fight to do what they are trained to do, and that's care for patients and families. Discharge our first positive uh, COVID patient that went home and start looking for the victories because you can get really lost in the uh, significance of what's going on in the ICU and probably 15% were able to make it out, but there's 85%. It was just constant that they were caring for these patients ongoing and there was no saving them. What else is coming for this group of people that have so significantly been exposed to the number of deaths that they've seen. Everyone had their day where they broke down, but there was always someone there to pick you up and to listen, and um, nobody was left lonely in their tears. It was the only part of humanity that was really involved with this whole scenario because these patients were just so alone at such crucial crisis moments and had no families around them. I don't think anybody 
could ever think that that was ever going to be experienced in our careers. Because of the amount of deaths we were seeing, we mobilized our psych and chaplaincy, our psych administrator and our chaplaincy program to actually create safe spaces on individual units where the nurses and staff could come away when they had those moments where they couldn't deal and to be in a safe space where there were encouraging words, uh, uh, posters that were placed on the wall so that the staff could be encouraged. Uh, the chaplain actually stayed in those areas from time to time and prayed with staff so that they could get through some of those experiences. And then, you know, the outpouring of the community, you know, they sent $40,000 for food. They, they had a parade, I think it was 24th, 22 communities where uh, they went by and the EMS ambulance, I think it was 120 vehicles went by to thank us. And, you know, it's those type of things that we wanted to continue to bring forward and have our employees and our managers see because uh, it, it was such a tra uh, traumatic uh, situation that we found ourselves in that we need to refocus the fact that a lot of good was coming out of this and a lot of positives were being seen by the community and they were reaching out to say thank you. As Brian said in the beginning, you know, there are a lot of courageous and brave people and each one of you on this phone are that. And, uh, you know, particularly, uh, you know, uh, Emily, you and John are kind of non-clinicians. You're sitting there in a, in a, at a time there was a very clinical world you know, all around you at all times. And for everybody to uh, establish the power of one, and it happened all at the same time, it was just an extraordinary story. And it, it is, uh, it shows willpower, it shows horsepower, it shows uh, commitment uh, in all those things. And uh, I, as uh, the CEO for the company, I can't tell you and thank you enough for what you sacrificed during this period of time. And so as an old hospital administrator uh, that's been through bumps, bruises, and, and a lot of other stuff, I am so proud of all of y'all. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate it.